Good morning, everybody. Yeah, good to see you this morning. Happy Labor Day weekend. Uh, I want to take a moment and just uh, restate something that Ashley said is next Sunday night is going to be a lot of fun. That's our honk and holler service, right? Honk if you love Jesus. And so if you know somebody that hasn't been comfortable coming back yet, encourage them to just drive up and, and be a part of service that way. So that's a great segue into welcoming our online church. And so those of you that are online watching us, good morning. We love you guys. And thank you for staying so faithful, man. Our people that haven't come back yet have never disconnected. They've stayed connected with us and continue to just give us feedback, continue to give. Thank you for your faithful giving as well. And so it's all been really good, and we're just trying to do everything we can to, to stay connected in that sense. Uh, we were in the middle of our first Peter sermon series, and uh, I've actually just interrupted that, or God did, and uh, God put a message on my heart. And I, first of all, I love preaching in series, and here's why, because it really gives you an opportunity to peel that onion, so to speak. You know, but sometimes we introduce a topic and then we don't get to go deep enough in just the short time that we have. But when you preach on that same topic week after week after week, you're really able to just dig in and find some great truths so that when you finish it, we all have a pretty good understanding. And that's one of the reasons I like to preach by doing sermon series. And then, but this particular time, God spoke to me and said, I, I got a message that I want you to share. And I really feel like it's from the heart of God. I said, God, that's a great idea. I'm, I'm going to preach that when I finish this series. And God said, excuse me? <laughs> I said, what I meant to say was, I'll get that in this weekend. So that's where we are. I want to share with you what God has put on my heart. And we'll wrap up 1 Peter, uh, those last two chapters, somewhere down the road. We'll get back to that. But I want to talk about today finding freedom. And I want to begin by, by just asking a question, and this is, you know, just one of those questions that, that, that we know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and that is, how free is freedom? And I think all of us know, especially since we are in a military town, I think all of us know that freedom really isn't free. Because the thing about freedom is this, is that it ha you have to fight for it. It has to be fought for. It has to be won. And then after you win it, it has to be maintained. And so we know that. And so this, just what we know that freedom is basically the same is true spiritually. The Bible does say that Jesus came to set us free and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But it doesn't mean that there aren't forces out there that are trying to rob us of that freedom or put us back in some type of bondage. And we have a responsibility to stay free and to live free. Someone said the Christians' three greatest enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, and think about that for a moment. Before I entered full-time ministry, I worked for an oil company. And one of my responsibilities was I was a salesman, meaning that I had to go out into the oil field, had to go out into the warehouses, I had to go out into uh, the work field and deal with customers, and I had to wear a coat and tie. That's the way we did it back in the day. Do you know how hard it is being in the oil field to keep a coat and tie from not getting dirty? It's impossible. But I would find myself walking around talking to people saying, I can't go near that. I got to stay away from that. I don't want to get close to that. I don't want to touch that. Come on, we got to do the same way with freedom sometimes. We got to be watching. So there's the world there's our self, hey man, our flesh. I've often said that your worst enemy is sitting right there in your chair. Don't look around at you, baby. <laughs> your worst enemy are the choices you make, the things that you do, the things that you don't do, and then the devil. And one thing I can say about the devil is that he works 24-7 at working against our freedom, trying to put us back into a bondage situation. So understanding that, and one of the things that, that he does doing that is, is he always, or not always, but there are times that he sends what I call these grace busters. Not ghost busters, but grace busters. And these are self-appointed people that feel like they're deputized by God to tell you that you can't be that free. You can't live that free. You can't be that free. You can't walk like that, talk like that, act, act like that, because it doesn't meet my standards 
And those people are always going to be out there in our lives. And what happens when we do that is we usually end up downsizing God's grace. That no longer is it this huge ocean of God's grace, but it's just something that is applicable in our lives from time to time. That's not grace. See, grace is an ocean, and here's the thing about it. Either you're in it or you're not. You can't kind of be in grace any more than you can kind of be pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. When you begin to understand grace, God's favor on you, then you really begin to understand the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so we end up downsizing God's grace, limiting our freedom, and restricting the liberty that God wants us to live in. Now, stay with me because I've got a lot to say this morning that I think God wants us to hear. And I want to begin with a scripture. This scripture, we, we're very familiar with. It is one of my favorite scriptures. I think it's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, and it comes from one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. That is Romans chapter 8. So let's look at it this morning. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Notice that I've highlighted the word condemnation. And let me give you a few definitions of what condemnation is. First of all, condemnation is strong disapproval. And there are a lot of people that go through life thinking that God disapproves of them. There could be nothing further from the truth. God doesn't disapprove of you. He may not approve of everything that you're doing, but don't get me wrong. He loves you. That is the message of the gospel, that God loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave Jesus. That's how much he loves you. So condemnation is a strong disapproval or it is, a, it is a sense of guilt and shame that stays with you long after God has forgiven you. In other words, there are a lot of people that can't get past their past. Even though God has forgiven them, they still have all of this baggage that they're carrying around with them. And they're still feeling like God doesn't approve of their lives. Or it is a devil telling you that you're less than. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. The devil telling you that you're unpromotable. You may be saved, but you're not going anywhere with God. Because of your mistakes, because of your goof-ups in the past, you have disqualified yourself. You have done some things, and God may forgive you, but you'll never really amount to anything. That is not the heart of God. That is not the message of the gospel. God is more concerned with where you're going than where you've been. In fact, our wounds and our scars don't disqualify us. Sometimes they equip us to help other people around us. Just knowing that we've been through some things to help other people from going and experience the same things. And then lastly, it is this feeling of unworthiness. And that happens because of guilt and condemnation in our lives. I read an article or a little quip about a guy by the name of Noel Coward. He died back in the early 70s. He was, a, he was a famous playwright. He was a great author. He was an actor. And on top of all of that, he was a prankster. And he was known for really doing these big, elaborate pranks. And one of the things that he did was he, he lived in England. As he, he wrote an anonymous letter, and he sent it to 10 of the most successful businessmen in the city. And here's what it said. It said, we know what you have done, and if you don't want to be exposed, leave town. It said, over the next few months, all 10 of those men moved. That's the power of being afraid. I'm going to be discovered. I'm going to be found out. That's, that's what happens when you live in fear of your past and of your conscience. And I'm just telling you, God has forgiven your past. Don't let the devil blackmail you with your past. God has forgiven it. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The wicked flee when no man pursues. You know what that is? That's paranoia. Well, no one's chasing you, and you're running away anyway. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
See, the Bible says that your adversary, my adversary, Satan, goes around as a roaring lion. Didn't say he was a roaring lion, but it says he goes around as a roaring lion looking for who he can devour. Now, let me just tell you something right up front. Satan cannot read your mind. That's good news this morning for some people. Amen? Everybody goes, whoo. <laughs> Satan cannot read your mind. You're not off the hook. God can. Amen. Satan cannot read your mind, but he can respond to your actions. I, I did some reading and, and research, and, and I found out here's something interesting about a lion. A male lion, its roar can be heard up to five miles away. No wonder this guy's king of the jungle, right? And something that a male lion will do while he's hunting is that he will put his nose right above the ground, just a few inches off the ground, and he will roar this incredible roar. Remember, it can be heard up to five miles away. But because he's roaring into the ground, animals that are in hiding have no idea where that's coming from. They don't know if it's coming from the left or right, north or south or wherever. And so they panic and they dart, leave out of their hiding places. And the moment they respond to fear, the, the, the enemy is able to attack them. How many picked up on that, right? The moment we begin to walk in fear and operate in fear, whether it's fear of our past or fear of the future or fear of what may happen, we fall right into the enemy's plan for our life. Your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And you need to be the one that says, not today, devil. Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There is therefore now no condemnation. Look at the rest of that verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, first of all, before I say anything, let me say this is good advice. The best way to, the best way to avoid temptation is to walk in the Spirit. The best way to, to avoid the enemy is to live close to God. All right? So that's good advice, right? But that's not in the Bible. The original manuscripts, that's not in there. What happened was, so the original manuscript said this, there is therefore now no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but the people that interpreted that got a little concerned that people are going to find too much liberty and too much freedom, so we better damper it down a little bit. We better qualify that, so we're just going to add to that who do not walk according to the flesh, but to the Spirit. And they're limiting that grace. So it really says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. That's good news this morning, amen? Freedom of grace in our lives. Here's some great advice. Look at this next verse. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. How many know there are a lot of people that think that's the reason Jesus came up? The reason that Jesus came was to make our life miserable. The reason that Jesus came was to point out all the areas that were missing. It. The reason that Jesus came was, uh, was because he just wanted to make life hard for us. But Jesus himself said, my, my burden's light. All of you that are heavy laden, all of you that are burdened, come to me because I'm going to make life easier. Listen, Jesus makes life better. Amen. Jesus makes life better. He doesn't make it bitter. He doesn't make it worse. He always makes life better. For God did not send a son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus' plan wasn't to come to create a religion that would put you in all types of bondage. It wasn't to create a long list of do's and don'ts of things that you can't do and say you've got to keep all of this long list of things to do. No, Jesus didn't, didn't come to condemn the world, but to set the world free and allow us to live in liberty. Let me show you a key to that. It's this next verse of Scripture, Psalm 32.5. And as David's talking, and David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. That's always a good thing to do. God knows it anyway. He's just waiting for you to own it. I acknowledge my sin to you. 
and my iniquity I have not hidden. God is all out there. You know me. You know my thoughts before I think them. You knew me while I was in my mother's womb. You know everything about me. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. All of that's good, amen? That I just, I just come clean with God. That's good therapy, right? And I just tell God, man, I've made mistakes. I've goofed up. I'm not trying to hide it from you. You know it already. I'm owning it so that we can get through this. But notice the last part of that verse. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See, we understand that God forgives us, but we also need to understand what forgiveness is. You, I, I confessed all of this stuff. I acknowledge all this stuff. But God, you forgave me. Sometimes we come to God and we make this confession, but we don't receive the forgiveness. We acknowledge all the things that we've done wrong. We acknowledge all the areas that we've fallen short. But the verse says, don't stop there. Understand the fact that God has forgiven me all of my iniquity. I've got a clean slate before God. I've got a clean canvas before God. So when I understand that I am forgiven, not that God is just overlooking and keeping all the guilt and condemnation, but God says, I'm taking that away. Here you go, start over again. That is a powerful truth for every believer to understand what God is doing there. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you seven grace-filled statements. Now, each one of these statements that I'm going to give you could be a sermon in and of itself. There is so much truth. These are just powerful, powerful statements about the subject of grace. And I want to break them down a little bit because I'm really trying to help some people here. And I feel like this is what God wants to say this morning. Here's the first one. Is that God loves to bless people who don't deserve it. That's the very nature of God. None of us deserve the grace of God, the goodness of God. And God blesses us not because we deserve it, not because we're good enough, but because that's his nature. It's the very nature of God to do that, not because of us and, and we're so good and we're making ourselves better. No, it's the very nature of God. It says, even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to do it anyway. That's a great statement, amen. That is a powerful truth, right? Look at this next one. God's riches at Christ's expense. Someone broke that down and said, here's a definition of grace. God's riches, God's best. See, again, freedom isn't free. Grace isn't free. We enjoy it, we receive it freely, but it cost heaven everything that it had. For God so loved the world, he gave his son Jesus. Because he loved you, he took heaven's best, and he sacrificed Jesus so that we could experience the grace of God in our life. So it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's free to us, but it costs Jesus everything to redeem you. Redeem means to buy back. In other words, you belong to God. But because of original sin, you fell into the hands of the devil. And God came back and said, I'm going to buy you back from the devil. And so he redeemed you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you starting to get what grace is all about? How powerful it really is. Look at this one. Other religions say do. There are a lot of religions that say that if you're going to, if you're going to serve their God, you've got to do certain things. And you've got to do them daily or regularly. You got to make penance, you got to make sacrifices, you got to travel, you got to do all of these things. Other religions say do. And no matter how much you do, it's never enough. But Christianity says done. I come to God, there's nothing left for me to do. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. He did it all, He made the ultimate sacrifice. And so God doesn't look at me and require things of me. I mean, and, and there's a great, great truth here. And I, I, if I can just communicate it clearly here there's a great truth is that, is that well, I serve God now not because I have to but because I want to and that everything that I do for God I do because it's in my heart not because I'm keeping a punch list I was talking to someone the other day and there's a difference between love Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments and it's like when I when I understand that that because I love him I want to keep his commandments there's a difference that if I go to my wife and, and every morning have a punch card and it says at 8 o'clock, tell your wife you love her. Honey, it's 8 o'clock, I love you. At 10 o'clock, compliment her. Honey, it's 10 o'clock, I think you're beautiful. How many know there's not a lot of sincerity to that? Right? 
I mean, I'm just punching, I'm just, I'm just marking things off my list. I'm just crossing through the list. I'm just trying to get through all of these things. But my heart's not in it. Jesus said, I've done it all. So now since he's paid everything, I just want to love him. I want to do it because that's my desire, because he loved me first. Justified. When I love this. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what that word means. Just, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God looks at me. That's how God looks at us. When he forgives us, we're totally forgiven. He doesn't hold our past over our head. He doesn't label us. Amen. But he looks at me, and I'm totally forgiven because of Jesus. The term in him or in Christ appears more than seven, appears 70 times in the New Testament. Now, here's the thing. If God says something once, it's significant. If he says something twice, it's very significant. But if he says something 70 times, come on, he is really trying to communicate something to us. And 70 times in the New Testament, he is talking about our relationship to Jesus is that we are in him or that we are in Christ. And I'll try to give you a picture of what that looks like. Let's just say, let's pick your favorite football team. And let's just say that they're in the Super Bowl. And so you are in because your team is in the Super Bowl, the biggest game of the year. And you are cheering your team on. And when your team scores the final touchdown, the winning touchdown, what do you say? You say, we won. And my question is, what's this we business? <laughs> what do you mean we? What did you do? You didn't make any tackles. You didn't even break a sweat. I mean, the most physical thing you did was walk to the bathroom. And yet you're sharing in the victory. You're saying, we won. We did it. When I am in Christ, his victory becomes my victory. I didn't do anything, but I now live a life of victory. His peace becomes my peace. His joy becomes my joy. I didn't do anything. I'm guilty by association. I am in him. I am on the team. That's what it means to be justified. I'm in Christ. Now, if you're real religious, this next one will bother you. So don't be real religious. Just hear what I'm saying. Religion sucks. Amen. <laughs> Religion sucks the life out of your relationship with God. It becomes that to-do list in your life. And it draws all the grace out of your life. When you begin to get religious and you begin to be acts-oriented and you begin to be performance-oriented, and we live in a world that we naturally want to do that because if you want to A, you got to work harder. If you want a promotion, you got to show up early, stay late. If you want to raise, you got to perform. If you want to be on the team, you want to be on the varsity team, you got to work harder. When it comes to grace, God says, I got this. Don't do anything. Religion sucks the life out of our relationship with God. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. He came to restore a relationship in our lives. If you're keeping count, two more. Grace properly understood won't result in more sin. And I know the fear that when you teach a message of grace is that people have, listen, Pastor, you're giving people a license to sin. And I'll just say that people have been sinning without a license for a really long time. <laughs> they're, not, they're not even applying for the permit anymore. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> grace properly understood won't result in more sin. In other words, it's not just a free-for-all that I'm in this grace thing. I can do anything I want to do. But what it results in is more devotion to God. Because he loves me, I want to serve him. Because he loves me, I don't want to wound him. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to break the heart of God. Because he loves me, I want to be a God-pleaser in my life. Grace properly understood doesn't result in more sin. 
but in greater devotion. I, I share this example in first service. It's that I have insurance on my car. And when I got insured, I didn't get in my car, pull out of the driveway, and say, I'm going to look for somebody I can run into now. Man, everybody on the road is a target. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I didn't go out trying to crash my car. Listen, I'm still driving very cautiously. I'm obeying the traffic signs. I'm trying to obey the speed limit. It's hard. God knows my heart. <laughs> God, God knows I want to obey the speed limits. Just something within me. But if I happen to crash my car, I'm covered. It wasn't my heart. It wasn't my desire. It wasn't what I was trying to do. It happened, but I'm covered. Hey Amen. That's, that's a pretty good definition there. And then the last one is this. Condemnation says shame on you. Reminds me of every mistake that I've ever made. It condemns me. How many know there's a difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Conviction is when the Holy Spirit says, don't go that way. Conviction is when the Holy Spirit says, don't play in the street. We don't tell our kids not to play in the street because we're mean. We tell our kids don't play in the street because we love them and we don't want to see them get hurt. Conviction says, don't play in the fire. We're not trying to be mean. We're just saying there's a good chance you're going to get burned. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, he's trying to tell you don't go that direction because I have your best interests at heart. And the best picture of, 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 of between the difference between condemnation and conviction is two New Testament characters, one called Peter, one called Judas. Judas experienced condemnation. And because he couldn't get over his failure, because he couldn't get past what he had done, he hanged himself. And that's exactly the devil's plan, to destroy you through condemnation. But Peter, who denied Christ as well, not once but three times, experienced conviction. And he understood the difference between condemnation and conviction. And he repented of the sin that he had committed and become one of the greatest voices of the New Testament that we've ever had. So when God convicts you, praise God. He's dealing with you. He loves you. He's trying to fix you. He's trying to get you going in the right direction. And all of those things are important in our life. I love this verse, and you should too. Psalms 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west. Now, how many know there's not an east pole and a west pole? There's only a north pole and a south pole. I mean, you can go around the globe, and you can connect the dots. But east from west is a continual line. That means they'll never meet. They'll never connect. God is so wise. God didn't say, I, I've thrown your sins away from the north, as far as the North Pole is from the, west, uh, from the South Pole. That you can measure that. He said, as far as the East is from the West, you'll never see them again. See, God doesn't just cover your sins. He doesn't keep record of it. He forgives you your sin. He's done away with your sin. He didn't upholster you. You know, when you upholster a piece of furniture, underneath that new material is something that is ratty, that is torn. Stuffings are coming out. You're embarrassed for people to look at it, so I'm going to re-upholster it so it'll look good. But if you dig deep enough, you'll find all those flaws. It's not what God did. He didn't re-upholster you. He forgave you and called you to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's taken your sins as far as the east is from the west. That means they're totally removed from your life. Even when you sin as a believer and you ask God to forgive you, he removes your sins from the east and from the west. There's two ways to get to God. Two ways that we can get to God. One is called the self-improvement plan. And that's when you just work on yourself and you work on yourself until you get better and better and better. Then you present yourself to God and say, here I am. God, look what you get. This is it, man. It don't get any better than this. And God says, your righteousness, your ability to try to be better by yourself is like filthy rags, dirty clothes, dirty diaper in the nostrils of God. So it, it, here, here's, here's the fault with that reasoning. 
It's like saying, man, I'm sick. When I get to feeling better, I'm going to go to the doctor, see what he has to say about me. How foolish is that? Because I'm sick, I need to go to the doctor so that he can help me get well. It's like my car is not running right. When I say, you know, when, when this thing starts running better, I'm going to take it to the mechanic. You're missing the point. While you're broken, while you're wounded, go and get help then. So I can get to God by this self-improvement plan, but the Bible says all have fallen short. None, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We don't even come close. So this has got to be off the list. Or I can go by the grace plan that says, God, I don't deserve it, but I need it. God, I, I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. I'm not here on my own merit. I'm here because of Jesus. And God looks at me through that reference and through that frame of mind. And in that sense, I am accepted. I want you to stand with me this morning, if you would, please. I love the prayer of salvation. For so many reasons. It is such an incredibly powerful prayer. And there's so much gospel in that prayer. So, many, so much great theology in that prayer. So many great things in that prayer. And we pray this prayer almost every week. And there's a reason that I do that. One, because people are getting saved every week. And we ought to give God glory for that. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. We can do it right now. We got time. But I also love praying that prayer because I want you to have that in your heart. That if you ever have an opportunity to lead someone, from, lead someone to Christ, you kind of have a pretty good idea of what that sounds like. I still remember today the first person I ever led to the Lord. That is just emblazed in my memory. When I led that person to the Lord, I'll never forget that moment. And so I want you to know that. But in praying that prayer, at the end of that prayer, what happens is the miracle of the new birth. The miracle of the new birth is when Jesus makes you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man or woman be in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's when God puts his spirit into your spirit. And you become something that has never existed before. You become a, you become a God man or a God woman. That your life is so entwined with Christ that you're different. Not perfect, but different, changed. And maybe you're here this morning and, and you say, man, I, I've been living under guilt and condemnation. I want to come out from under that. You don't have to be perfect to leave that behind, but you have to know the one who is perfect. And if you've never prayed that prayer, that means I'm giving my life to God and I'm, I'm asking him, his spirit to move into my heart, to move into my spirit. I'm asking him to make me that miracle man, that miracle woman. I would love to have the opportunity to do that today. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to step out. You can experience God's grace right where you are. If you've never prayed that prayer, here's a great time. Or maybe you have prayed that prayer and you say, I need to rededicate my life. Today would be a good day to rededicate your life. So I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. And understand that even though physically you're standing here spiritually, we have an audience before a living God that is reaching out to you. And if you've never prayed the prayer of salvation and made a commitment to be a Christ follower with your life, and you say, this morning I want to do that, I'm not going to ask you to step forward. I'm just going to ask you to be honest. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. When you pray, would you pray for me? If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? Amen. God bless you. Are there others? I want to pray that prayer. To raise your hand right now. I'll see it. God see it. We'll pray. You'll have a miracle. Amen. You can put it down. Maybe there's others this morning that say, I want to rededicate my life. I'm ready to get back on track. I'm ready to get some traction with God. Let me see your hand this morning. If you're at that place of rededication, God bless you. Others this morning, God bless you. Thank you. Everyone that raised your hand, look at me for just a moment. Everybody look at me just a moment. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Don't just repeat it out of your head, though. I want you to say it with your whole heart. I want you to mean it. This is your life. This is your moment. 
And the Bible says that when you finish this prayer, listen, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't matter what the devil says, doesn't matter what you feel, God says that old things have been done away with. All things have become new. That means you can leave here today with a load lifted. You can leave here today experiencing freedom. Say this prayer after me. Everyone together, let's say it together. Dear God, today, I come to you just the way that I am. God, I'm sorry that I've lived my life without you, that I've run from you. But today, I run to you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sin. You took my place. You rose from the dead. And with resurrection power, today you offer me eternity with you. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I am forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give them a hand and give the Lord a hand as well. Amen. Never grow tired of that. Never get tired of praying that prayer. Now, before we move on, first of all, those of you that prayed that prayer, you need to tell somebody. If you need to get on social media and you need, that's social media. If you didn't know that, that's social media. My social media. All right. You got to quiet the whole room. Anybody else like that? When you get on social media, you got to make everybody be quiet. That's me. If you need to get on social media and tell somebody, if you need to call somebody, if you need to tell the person next to you, hey, wake up, I just got saved while you were sleeping. Whatever you need to do, that's okay. Just let them know. And we, would love to, we would love to be one that you tell. There's a card on the seat back in front of you if you want to fill that out. Drop it in one of the offering receptacles. Just hand it to me. When I get it, I'll give you a card and, and a letter and just want to let you take that, help you take that next step in your life. But we're so proud of you and thank you for doing that. But if you're here this morning, I want to pray this prayer and say, man, I am fighting for freedom. The devil has been at me because that's his job. And I'm fighting to stay free and I've got all this baggage and all of this stuff that I, I've carried around today. I just want to really be free. Amen. Can we just take a moment and lift our hands and experience the freedom of God? Father, I pray for everyone this morning that desires freedom in their life. Father, that right now, today, we experience God's grace in our life. And Father, everything that the enemy has worked to put on us and to hold us back, the, the weights of sin that so easily entangle us, Father, right now, we let them go in the name of Jesus. Because we are a free people, free to serve you, free to love you. We cannot afford to get tangled up we cannot afford to get tied up in all of the things of this world. But Father, we let them go in the name of Jesus. And we experience your freedom in our hearts and your freedom in our lives. God, we embrace it right now in the name of Jesus. And we hold up hands as free men and free women. That we are free in our mind, that we are free in our spirit. And Father, that we are purposing today to walk in greater liberty and greater freedom out from under condemnation because we repeat it again whom the sun sets free amen is free indeed amen amen let's give the lord a hand one more time god bless you this morning god bless you this morning god bless you this morning those of you that are watching online we love you thank you for praying with us we're going to worship god with this chorus those of you that are home worship with us together this morning we love you